Well, welcome everybody uh, for being here. Um, some of you people who are in our audience um, will notice that um, you are muted and your video is off. Um, we, we are recording, um, but please feel free to participate. If you have questions for our panelists, please just type those in to the chat and I will field those to them. Um, we have five people on our panel today and um, we are going to uh, be talking about uh, Band Book Week, and this is our Band Book Week panel. So a little history about Band Book Week. Band Book Week is an annual event that uh, celebrates the freedom to read. Uh, Band Books Week was launched in 1982 in response to a sudden surge in the number of challenges to books in schools, bookstores, and libraries. Typically held during the last week of September, it highlights the value of free and open access to information, uh, Ban Books Weeks brings together the entire book community, librarians, booksellers, publishers, journalists, teachers, and readers of all types in shared support of the freedom to seek and express ideas, even those that some might consider unorthodox or unpopular. Um, taking a look at our um, library mission statement and the vision of the library here at Muncie Public Library, uh, Muncie Public Library mission statement um, we will provide accessible and innovative services responding to the reading, informational and educational and enrichment needs of the community. Um, in our vision statement, we say that we commit ourselves to the community and will strive to provide leadership in solving the problems facing the community through a variety of strategies, including public conversation and town hall meeting events. And it's sort of in response to that mission statement and that vision statement of the library that we have events like this. And so um, here we all are. And so I think what we're gonna do is we're just going to introduce our panelists and they, after I introduce one of them, they're gonna talk for five to eight minutes and they're gonna present on their particular level, their particular area of expertise. And then after we get through all five of them, they might discuss amongst themselves and you in the audience are welcome to type questions to them and type them into the chat and I will field them to them. And I myself might have some questions and this should just be a very casual kind of open dialogue regarding this topic. And so I believe I said that I was going to start with uh, Dr. Ben Bascom. Uh, Ben is the assistant professor of English at Ball State University, where he teaches and writes about early and 19th century American literature and culture and contemporary LGBTQ studies. He is currently working on a book manuscript titled Feeling Singular, Queer Masculinities in the Early United States, which tells an alternative account of the founding decades of the United States through focusing on the stories and writings of an eccentric and motley set of characters. Uh, Ben, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. Uh, pardon the slight delay. It's a pleasure to be here to um, talk about uh, this, the sort of history of censorship in, in my field of study, which is 19th, 19th century American literature. Um, I have a few a little bit of an outline of what I want to share if my screen will move and and let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so I work on 18th and 19th century American literature and I thought for today I would actually share the story of one really famous banned book called um, Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure by John Cleland. Um, and I wanna put in that in context to a variety of changes in the 18th century, political and social organizations that were being formed, such as William Wilberforce's Proclamation Society and the Society for the Suppression of Vice, and then put that in conversation with 19th century print and technology revolutions. A lot of my um, research that I'll be sharing today is from Marcus uh, McCorison and um, a book on the flash press, which was about 19, eight, sorry, 1840s um, sporting dailies, which were newspapers that were pretty salacious in content to kind of critique vice, but in it, in that effort actually kind of exposed and, and made people aware of where one could find um, sort of 
uh, satisfaction of particular appetites. So a case study in this novel that I want to talk about, um, John Cleland's uh, Memoirs of the Woman of Pleasure, first published in 1748, um, potentially written while the author was in debtor's prison, and subsequently called Fanny Hill um, afterwards. In 1750, it was banned um, and uh, ceased uh, authorized publications. Um, but after that, because it was so, you know, salacious and such, it had a lot of wide circulation in off prints or in surreptitious editions um, from the 18th century to the 20th century. In a lot of ways, the book became almost a screen for um, talking about uh, desires that were not supposed to be in the public sphere per se. Um, this book is particularly interesting because it wasn't legally published until the 20th century. Um, and it was after a case before the Supreme Court of Massachusetts um, that argued that the moral value of this book superseded its content. Um, so an interesting little moment, if we had time, I'd, I'd read this more. Um, sorry to break character, but my notes aren't visible on this. So I'm just like kind of going for it. Um, in the 19th century, um, this book, Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure, um, received uh, even more pushback when it was published in the 18, 18s, um, sorry, 18 teens um, by the, um, the governor of Massachusetts banned its publication. And a man named William Coolidge wrote in response, whether there is any law in our state to prohibit such publications, I know not, or whether any law could be made that would not do more hurt than good, I leave for thy consideration. It was still banned um, because it was too um, salacious in content for, um, for what it was about. Um, now, one little speculation I wanna throw out there that I find interesting in my own research. So in the American Antiquarian Society, uh, which is a library in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, a printer by the name of Isaiah Thomas used prints of this book that was banned, um, Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure, as the back marbling for uh, covers. Um, and as you can see, it says it was published in London in 1787, but in fact, it was published in Massachusetts uh, in the 1810s. Um, so it's an interesting little moment where this ostensibly banned book um, received circulation in this kind of surreptitious way where it was used as a cover and marbled. Maybe it was like an inside joke um, between um, printers sort of like flaunting um, the laws that were against the book. It's an interesting thing to speculate though. Um, I wanted to also kind of touch base about in the 19th century um, where censorship also sort of saw uh, a, an important vector was in newspapers. Um, this, these images are from what's called the flash press in New York in the 1840s. Um, and the ostensible idea of these newspapers were to penalize vice and sort of say like, oh, this terrible thing's happening. But in the same gesture of sort of pointing out vice, it very clearly elicits uh, sexual innuendo and sexual response. So the image on the right, um, you see a, 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 an individual looking up the skirt of a woman who is uh, preparing to enter a place to um, purchase various uh, fashionable accoutrement. And then the figure on the left, um, it's from a newspaper that was um, uh, trying to critique uh, sexual uh, salaciousness, but in its depiction also sort of depicted sex, right? Um, I, since my notes aren't available, I'm going to just kind of wrap it up there. I'm sorry that I just stopped mid sentence, but sometimes we just go with technology. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Ben. Um, let's, uh, 
we will now move on to Shanna. Um, Shanna Hurd is the Youth Services Supervisor at the Marion Hunt Library. She has been working in youth services since 2008. Uh, Shanna received her MLS from Indiana University in Bloomington with a focus on public and youth services. Uh, thank you, Shanna, for being here. Um, hello, I'm happy to be here. Um, so obviously I've been working with children in libraries for quite a while. And the number one thing when I think about Fan Books Week is that I really believe in the right of a child to have the freedom to read really whatever they want to. Um, and that that's really important. People don't always realize for like very young children as they're learning to read, sometimes well-meaning caregivers, they'll say, oh, you can't read that. That's not, that's not good enough. But you want a child to read something they enjoy because that encourages them to learn how to read, to keep reading, increases their vocabulary. So that when they get into that third grade where they're now reading to learn, they have those skills. And then of course, as they get older, they're learning about the world. And again, well-meaning adults think they can say, oh, that's a topic you shouldn't read about. I'm gonna take that away without really considering, you know, how are the kids gonna get that information if you take away this book? Um, I recently saw a talk by Jean Luen Yang, who is a um, graphic novel artist and writer. And he said, you know, a book that takes, you know, a year, years to write, they really think about what they are writing about. And if you say, you can't read this book on the topic, what's the kid gonna do? They're gonna go on the internet and they're gonna find you know, the five minute Reddit version that somebody put online. So you take that good conversation and replace it with like the cheap internet version and see what they come up with. That's not necessarily helpful. Um, and also just having a lot of topics about a lot of people it's good because, first of all, kids deserve to see books that represent them. And all too often, the books that are challenged are ones that affect kind of marginalized um, groups. And then kids that aren't in those marginalized groups, they develop empathy by reading books about other people. Um, and uh, Anthony kind of mentioned, you know, youth are really disproportionately affected by these challenges and bans. Um, I'm going to share just a, a little bit the top 10 from 2020 that were either banned or challenged. Um, the first one is George by Alex Gino, and this is a kid's book. It is about a transgender child and, of course, was challenged and banned due to that LGBTQ plus content, that it conflicted with somebody's religious viewpoint, that it didn't reflect the values of the community. That's a quote. Um, so somebody got to decide for everybody in that community that this isn't okay. Number two was Stamped Racism, Anti-Racism in You by Ibram X. Kendi and Jason Reynolds. And again, this is a nonfiction book. It's for teens and it deals with racism and people didn't want that to be shared with their teens. Apparently um, they, they felt it doesn't encompass racism against all people. So apparently if you're gonna have a book about racism, you have to somehow know about every bit of racism everywhere. Um, the next one, number three, All American Boys by Jason Reynolds and Brendan Keeley is another teen book. And again, it's another book that deals with racism, police brutality and people, oh, that's anti-police. We can't let that in the schools. Um, the next one is Speak by Lori Halt Anderson. This one has been on the list many years and it deals with a girl that is raped. So another teen book, you know, and we can't have teens reading about that even though it happens in real life. Um, and then uh, yet another teen one, uh, number five is The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi. And this is about a Native American, it includes um, profanity and sexual references. It's also one of the very few books for teens by a Native American that deals with modern day. There are some authors, there just aren't a ton. So if you take that away, then you're limiting the opportunities for teens to read about 
Native Americans that live on reservations that might be, you know, far away from here. We wouldn't, you know, necessarily know anybody in that situation. So a book might be the only way a teen has to learn about that initially. Um, number six is Something Happened in Our Town, A Child's Story of Racial Injustice by Marianne Solano. This is a kid's picture book that deals with the police shooting. And of course, it was challenged for divisive language and anti-police views. Um, you know, and obviously this is something somebody is thinking here is a conversation starter for young kids. They, they see the news, like if a parent is watching the news, then the kid also sees the news whether people think about that or not. So sometimes you need a way to speak to even very young kids about tough topics. Number seven is the classic To Kill a Mark Mockingbird by Harper Lee. I mean, that one is on the list year after year. And of course that's handed to teens a lot. Number eight of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck is another one of those classics that, oh, it's got, you know, the racial slurs. It's a historical perspective about, you know, how things were at one time and to tell it because they just can't see it. It seems a shame to me. Um, number nine is The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. This one isn't necessarily a teen book, but it's another one that gets handed to teens uh, when you look it up. Um, in children's resources, it's considered a book for high schoolers, like that it's okay to give to high schoolers, but it does have um, depictions of child sexual abuse. So that is why that one is often challenged. And the last one, number 10, The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Again, another teen book, and it deals with a police shooting of a teen. And of course, people don't like it because there's profanity and of course, Again, that very political anti-police message that people claim it has. Um, I read the book. I don't personally think it feels particularly anti-police. It's just discussing in a fictional story something that's really happening. So, you know, of these 10 top 10 books, most of them are teen or children books. So this is who is, you know, missing out potentially and they're not included in that conversation. And the conversation can get really ugly. Um, as a public librarian, I occasionally get parents and they'll say, oh, this book had a cuss word and I don't know if I like that. I can usually have a conversation and usually they go away going, oh, okay, you'll help me find what's appropriate for my family and that's okay. It's the schools that get the really tough things and it's happening all over, including um, just recently in Carmel. If you didn't hear just this past summer, um, Carmel had a school board meeting that was actually completely interrupted by protesters over the books that were in the schools. Um, and from Fox 59's website, the headline was Carmel parents outraged over sexually explicit content found in books available to students. And this was just this past July. And these people came prepared with books to read where they, you know, marked the excerpts that would be the most salacious. They came with t-shirts that said, you know, I'm a concerned parent. They were ready for it. Um, and the most interesting and worst part about it was when the superintendent responded, what he said was, um, some of the books they mentioned aren't on our rolls that we have. We will go into the buildings and look to make sure. So they were just picking books they didn't like. They didn't even really know if they were in the school. So people have a bone to pick with certain types of books. And, and they're just gonna go and flood the school, flood the school board meeting to try to remove them. And it's regardless of what educators think is good, what librarians think is good and what kids wanna read. That's what I prepared. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Um, um, that's great. Um, okay, so... Uh, Moving on here uh, to our our next panelist is uh, 
Ralph E. Dowling. Uh, Ralph moved his law practice from Indianapolis to Muncie and began practicing law with his wife, Kimberly Dowling. Um, Although Kim has been taken has taken the bench as judge of Delaware County Circuit Court Number Two, Ralph continues the traditions of the Dowling Law Office. The Dowling Law Office is dedicated to serving the legal and personal needs of clients and community. Ralph Dowling has lived in Delaware County since 1984. Ralph focuses his practice on personal injury cases, family law of all kinds, and civil appeals. Ralph has practiced in state and federal trial and appellate courts in over a dozen states. Uh, Ralph, thank you for being with us. Ralph, I believe- Thank you, thank you for having me. I almost forgot to turn on my microphone. Um, in case that sounded like a sales pitch, it's because Anthony was kind enough to cut it from my website when I was slow about returning a real biography. But thank you, Anthony. <laughs> All right, I wanted to talk about the, the legal aspects of this, but before that, there was one point I wanted to make. Um, back when I was working on my doctorate, uh, many, many, many years ago, the guy with the office next to me was an expert in how people feel about First Amendment and free speech issues. And the most consistent finding in the literature in those days was that people tend to be bipolar on it. They're either really, really all free speech or they really aren't. There's not very many people in between who think, oh, we can censor some, but not so much. And uh, in my experience in life, that seems to be true. Uh, and it's always nice when the research seems to reflect what happens in your real life. The legal aspects uh, of this situation, I'm gonna try to get this uh, document shared with you all. Okay, right there. All right, are we seeing a slideshow here? Yes. It's not showing it to me, that's the trick. Okay. So the legal aspects of uh, any kind of censorship, I'll start with the First Amendment, which if we edit it down to just what applies to uh, books, and we leave out freedom of speech and assembly and all of that, Congress shall make no law bridging the freedom of speech or of the press. That uh, some people read that and think, well, that's only the federal government. It was the federal government until uh, the Supreme Court in 1925 in the Gitlow case said, like almost all of the um, items in the Bill of Rights, the 14th Amendment has made that um, same language applicable to state governments. When it comes to school districts or cities, whatever, they're just creations of state government. So the law applies to them as well. And it's within that context that these kinds of decisions have to be made. Now, back in the old days, <clears throat> the only way they would uh, really work on free speech was they would ban certain kinds of speech by criminalizing it. People could go ahead and say it. And it used to be that they applied what was called the bad tendency test. This was used to put like socialists who were running for president and getting 2% of the vote and saying they were against the war, try to put them in prison because it had a tendency to lose the war for the allies, I guess. Uh, eventually in 1919, the Supreme Court said that's not the test anymore. If we're going to criminalize speech, it's got to be speech that creates a clear and present danger. Otherwise, the First Amendment does not allow the states or the federal government to uh, put people in jail for it, which is encouraging. But that doesn't keep people from uh, trying to ban books all the time. Uh, as you can see uh, here, this is from the American Library Association's website. They talk about what kind of challenges there are, and they found last year, 2020, there are 156 challenges that they were brought to their attention. There's no national database of this. And they found this 73% of what was challenged were books and graphic novels, uh, and, and then there are much smaller percentages of other things. So it continues to be books that's the target of people trying to censor. The 10 most challenged books, you already heard about most of these. Uh, again, this is from the ALA's website, and they've got all the way back to 2009, I think, year by year. And some of the books are on there virtually every year. Uh, some of them got on a few years ago and have never gotten off. And it's always for the same reasons, always. Uh, and as for who brings these challenges, half of them are brought by parents because they're concerned about the children, 20% uh, by library patrons. 11% by boards and administrators, and then much smaller percentages by other groups. 
So obviously school libraries are gonna get hit by the parents and public library patrons are gonna get hit by, or public libraries can be getting hit by their own patrons. This is one of those nice uh, graphic illustrations of the reasons that people um, get up and try to ban books or in the case of libraries, get them removed. They seem never to really uh, stop them from getting in the library. They just try to remove them afterwards which is actually from a legal perspective, just as difficult, but it keeps being tried. So the, the overall from the American Library Association is if you look at the 10 years from 2000 to the end of 2009, they were made aware of 5,099 challenges uh, to books that were people were trying to censor. And you can see the topics were overwhelmingly sexually explicit material and offensive language followed eh, sort of closely by uh, unsuited to the age group and violence and homosexuality sort of bringing up the rear. But there are some other you know, topics that are listed there. Now those don't exactly add up to the next list in numbers because some of them, uh, some of these were challenged on more than one grounds. And then the challenges were uh, 1,639 of them were in school libraries, 1,800 in classrooms, 1,200 in public libraries. So everybody's getting it. There were even 114 challenges to what's used in college classes where you like to think freedom of speech is sort of its last stronghold, but apparently it's not. <laughs> so there you go. We're trying to unshare now for the moment. Come on machine, there we go. Now, the, the trick to um, censorship is it has long been the case that it's very difficult, or not, if not impossible, to um, censor something before it's created. You can't do prior restraint on speech. You can, clear and present danger, um, criminalize it. And the other thing that's commonly known is you can put on speech reasonable time and place restrictions. So you can tell people, no, you can't stand up in front of this church on Sundays and preach against what they're preaching inside. You can go out to the sidewalk, you can go down the street, but you can't you know, impinge on their uh, personal uh, property by being there and doing it. And that's a reasonable constraint based upon time and content is not allowed. If you're doing it by content, you say, well, we have a law against saying anti-church things while churches are going on. That's a content restriction. But if you make the restriction, you can't talk about anything and put them out on the street to talk, uh, then it's not a content restriction. It's a reasonable time and place restriction. That boundary could get blurry at times. Uh, but that's how we can still regulate if we wish to. And that's, of course, where people try to go. But because they can't restrain people writing books, they can't make that illegal, um, unless there's a clear presentation, you can't stop them from uh, uh, selling the books and publishing the books, and you can't keep people from buying the books. All you can do when it comes to censorship is either stop the library from buying it, which almost never happens in, in, to my knowledge, or try to get it out of the library after the library already has it. And that's, that's the focus of school book censorship and library censorship is getting rid of books they already have. People don't seem to care enough to get involved in, on deciding what books ought to be bought, but they're real happy to complain after the book's on the shelf and it's brought to their attention. So that's where the focus has to be when we talk about censored books. By the way, my favorite censored book is Huckleberry Finn, gets censored all the time. I've probably read that book eight or nine times beginning then. Love the book. The fact that this is that horrible uh, racial language to make the point that horrible racial views are horrible uh, never seems to uh, sink into people. And so they wanna ban it by missing the point of the book. The, you know, the, about, the, the bottom line is that um, the law ought to be, and usually is that, if you have time for two ideas to fight, anti-racism and, and you know, pro-racism, both people are allowed to speak, both people are allowed to publish books, both kinds of books could be in the library. The point is the bad ideas should be driven out by the good ideas. That's the principle of free speech on which the First Amendment was written. But in real life, people are afraid that, you know, you pick up that book about that um, trans child, and I guess your child's going to become trans the next day because they read a book about it. I assume that's the fear. Uh, whatever the fear might be, the laws are very difficult um, to track when it comes to what you can and cannot do. The American Library Association was one of many parties to a recent case, which was not about books in a library, but it was about a, a federal law that required 
filters be put on internet accessible computers in libraries to protect the children so they can't get a hold of stuff. Uh, and that was challenged as being a violation because it violated the free speech rights of the people putting the stuff on the internet and the free speech rights of the patrons who wanted to uh, look at that information. And ultimately the court said, well, because there are exceptions where an adult could come in and say, I want this filter taken off, then it doesn't really restrain people from looking at what's on the internet. They just have to ask permission first. The fact that many libraries never bought that software that you could do that with and you know, that there's often nobody around who knows how to do it on the computer. Those are issues raised but ignored by the court. So that kind of, of, of censorship, which they said is not really censorship, is allowed. Then there's a difference between um, censorship of what's um, said in a book and put in a library and what they call government speech. It's okay to regulate government speech. The, the easiest case to understand there was there was a case in um, the state of Maine where Governor LePage had his people take out from the Department of Labor in Maine a beautiful mural uh, on the history of labor and its struggles and successes in the United States. Made him take it out of there because it had a pro-labor message, which I guess is an anti-corporate message. Anyway, that was the point. He said, no, that's okay because the mural that's on the wall is government speech. It's put in front on a government wall with government funds in front of people. They could take that down if they want to and put it somewhere else or put it nowhere else. But that's not the same as when a book is, or library is full of books. It's not government speech. By having a book does not turn it into government speech. Some cases have attempted to do that and the court's been very resistant to allowing that. So what they have tried to say, it, or try to tread the, the, the narrow road here between um, content-based restrictions and reasonable time and place restrictions, and what they seem to think makes it special because they're schools or they're libraries. There's nothing in the First Amendment that says the standard applies differently in a school than it does in a public place, or in an elementary school versus a high school versus a college. But the case is treated that way, and they don't generally acknowledge that they're doing so outside of anything the First Amendment ever said. So what we have is uh, everybody's trying to find new ways to justify essentially censoring books based on their content, because all of these are content restrictions, but all of them are. They'll try to make them reasonable time and place by saying, well, they're appropriate for older kids, so put them in another library. First Amendment doesn't say that either. So... The, the law is complicated. Cases keep being brought. Most of these people um, lose their cases uh, unless they follow the most recent couple of cases where they say you could take a book out of the library, but if it looks like you're taking it out for a pretextual reason and a real reason is content based, and you don't like these books, then it may well violate the Constitution, uh, both the state and federal level, and the book will have to be put back on the shelf. But they're hard thankless cases to bring. There's no money to, to be made in that kind of, uh, of a case. And there seems to be more people interested in protesting and getting books out than people uh, interested in hiring lawyers to put the books back in. Sad but true. That's the legal perspective. Okay. Um, thank you uh, very much. Um, all right. So uh, I'm going to move on here to um, Akila. No sock here. Um, Akila has earned two professional degrees from Ball State University and an MLS degree from Clark Atlanta University. An administrator, she has served as an information specialist in corporate and academic libraries. An Africa Studies subject specialist, she has served as a library consultant in the Ivory Coast, West Africa, and presented a paper on academic library online development at the International Federation of Library Association in Lyon, France in 2014. Uh, Akila is a co-author of African American Studies core list of resources and co-editor of the 21st Century Black Librarian in America, Issues and Challenges. Uh, her most recent work appears in Where Are All the Librarians of Color, published in Library Juice Press in 2016. She has guided the research of scholars and has contributed biographical articles to numerous African American history encyclopedias, and she... Uh, became the director of Muncie Public Library in 2017. Uh, thank you, Akila, for being with us. Thank you, Anthony, for putting this panel together and for asking me to be a part of it. Um, well, banned books and challenged books, as you know, ALA deals with this issue through its division um, 
of uh, the freedom of intellectual, uh, uh, the intellectual freedom division, which means that we want to provide uh, opportunities for folks to read uh, all those materials that are out there are available to them. And what I've done um, over the years in my 30 some odd years as a librarian, basically I worked the reference desk for in the beginning where we, you know, we pay our dues and we learn about all the different uh, uh, subjects just through our work, you know, of, of researching for others. And, and there are some materials that come out that, you know, are banned and you what do you mean they banned of mice and men? You know, there's something that we read, you know, in school during the, the 70s when I was in high school, you know? And then we see, uh, for example, I think you mentioned um, uh, the, the book, uh, the lawyer's book you just mentioned. Um, what's, what's that book? Um, anyway. To Kill a Mockingbird. To Kill a Mockingbird, which recently came out as a um, graphic novel. And in 2018, we had it as one of our titles for our, our reading, you know, across the city. And so it's amazing how these books rotate on and off that list. Um, what I did, I do have some slides I want to share as well. I looked at some resources where we could go uh, to find out uh, recent information and what's going on now about banned books. And we are very happy with uh, ALA for providing us opportunities to, uh, to look at those lists from year to year. And I'm trying to pull my presentation up here. Here we are. Can you guys see that? Banned books, today's my name and the date. Okay, and I wanted to first talk about uh, the American Library Association banned and challenged books. And it is a website that uh, Ralph put it out to us. And I went in this morning just to kind of look to see what's the, the latest in terms of um, banned books. And what this website does is to aggregate those articles that are out there. As uh, Ralph pointed out, there's no data, there's no uh, database out there that has all of this information. It is just kept by it. Uh, one or two or several groups and they're separate, um, separate collections. Um, this morning I read, uh, it was in the Philadelphia Inquirer and it's uh, September the 20th, where students, parents and educators gathered outside of the Central York School District to protest the district um, resource list that Shanna referred to, you know, because they have uh, these resource lists for the school systems. Okay, and so this was in York County, right outside of Philadelphia, and uh, they were protesting <clears throat> the, the um, listing of these books. And so they brought uh, examples from their home libraries and from their school libraries, and they filled like a whole plaza with all of these books. Some of the most recent ones being, you know, The Hate You Give, or Two Boys Kissing, or My my Second Dad, those kinds of books dealing with um, uh, um, the various issues uh, uh, of gay life in, in America, and also um, Black life, which is uh, another area that is commonly uh, banned and challenged within the school system. Okay, the, another source that I ran across for finding out about books and the history of, of books that are, are challenged and uh, banned was this one. It's the National Coalition Against Censorship. And Ralph gave us a good background about censorship and how um, it's how it's perceived in the, the legal field. Uh, I looked at their vision and basically the vision of this particular group is we envision an American society that understands, value, defends, and vigorously exercise free expression in a just, egalitarian, diverse, and inclusive democracy. And I think that is the underlying rootedness in our uh, fight against or our our actions to make sure that we have intellectual freedom and beginning at early ages all the way through um, our, our elder years. So these two organizations try to keep us informed on those efforts to, to stop um, the free expression and free reading throughout um, the country. 
that this is a very good uh, site. I found a list of the 10 most challenged African-American titles uh, on this website. And from that list, what I did was to pull those, those my favorites, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, also on this website, I, their mission was quite important. They said, for every generation of Americans, we face new and significant challenges to free expression. As we can see with um, uh, Alex, um, Alexis, what's his name? Alex um, Sherman's book, uh, The Part-Time Indian. I can never remember titles, but you know, I remember the books, you know, the experiences of, of a part-time Indian. But he, um, provides that as an example, but for every 50 years, uh, we see a, a resurgence of, of these efforts. And the uh, coalition has acted as the first responder to protect this freedom, which is constantly under attack. Um, this freedom of reading, or freedom of intellectual freedom is both fundamental, it's a fundamental human right, and the keystone to democracy wherever uh, in our ever-changing American nation. And we have to think about how we live today and what's going on today and how we must continue that uh, fight against books being uh, challenged and, and uh, banned in our collection. So we're glad that they promote freedom of thought, inquiry, and opposed censorship. Uh, the controversy occurs, they say, as we encourage and facilitate dialogue between all of these divergent um, voices and uh, perspectives, including those have been those who have been historically silenced, such as uh, Native Americans in, in, the, uh, in their homelands, um, the reservations, and African Americans out of their communities and their experience in America. And I'm sure there are some Asian titles on there too, but I picked three from their list because my subject area is African American studies, but I try to read widely and move a bunch of different areas. I think uh, Ralph pointed out what his favorite uh, band book uh, is. Mine uh, is the, the Bless Me Altima, which was uh, when I moved to New Mexico, it was like uh, the read for the city. And I said, wow, uh, I have wouldn't have thought such a wonderful story, tender story would be banned. But there was a uh, fear of uh, the Ultima for the grandmother who they perceived as a witch, you know, being anti-Christian and those sorts of things. So I was living near um, uh, a town where the book was banned uh, from the school. Uh, and it was Artesia, New Mexico, and that we had to go to the school board meeting and fight for this book and talk about how how tender it is and the it's um, a a coming of age a book for a young man and his relationship with his grandmother, how close they were, and it's such a tender book. But so we had to kind of push the positive. Uh, positiveness of the book and to make sure that it would remain in the public library and in the schools. And I can say that we were successful, but they did burn that book uh, the year before. That was uh, 2016 there. Okay, so this is a great source. Uh, it has a quote here from Maya Angelou, which is, you know, it's been on the list uh, for many, many years, as we pointed out. Um, and then uh, this is one of my favorite titles, uh, Ernest Gaines. I think he's most famous for his book, um, The Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, which is, you know, uh, which is very well accepted uh, within the uh, American society. But this other title, A Lesson Before Dying, is set, as you can see, let's see, let me move my thing over here, set in fictional uh, community of uh, Bayonne, um, Louisiana in the 1940s, uh, late 1940s, dealing with the racial issue, the Jim Crowness of the time, and it's a, a story of Jefferson, a young 21-year-old black man who was a field worker and who was convicted of uh, robbery and murder of a white man and sentenced to death. Well, one of his friends returned to talk with him uh, and to to see if there was anything that he could do to save. Uh, his friend from uh, his uh, appointment uh, with the electric chair. 
However, the book, uh, well, in the book, it was not successful, but as you know, it is a novel based on um, the experience that we know to be true throughout the South uh, during that time. So it was banned and as, as late as uh, 2018 by a parent uh, complaint, and it was in Florida, uh, uh, Dixon, Dixie County, Florida, uh, the population less than 17,000. It's kind of a resort community. I went in to see well, what types of people live here who would object to such a, a book. And uh, it's a resort community of about uh, 17,000 people. They have one library and uh, uh, not very many titles, but uh, the book was uh, uh, banned or, uh, or challenged because of the material and of course it included profanity, which we hear a lot about um, why people don't want these books in the school systems, cursing and inappropriate subject matter. And that inappropriate subject matter has to do with uh, the life experience of this, uh, this kid, uh, Jefferson and the electrocution, you know, we try to protect our children from the realities of life. So I'm thinking that was probably uh, one of the, the reasons behind it. Um, so at first, this book came out in 1993 and it is still on the list uh, this year. A lesson before dying, as I talked about, uh, deals with uh, a young man trying to help another man overcome um, the, the uh, prejudice and hatred, which was, you know, as we know, was rampant in the Jim Crow South. Uh, it was, a, it is a Pulitzer Prize winning book, and it was selected as the Oprah Book Club book in 1997. Another one of my favorites that's on the list that comes up every now and then, it's a preteen book. And I'm sure Shanna is, uh, <laughs> knows about this particular title. Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, which is a classic in the African-American tradition. It is written from a perspective of a, a young girl, a nine-year-old girl, um, so about her family and their fight against racism and the racist system that was attempting to take the family land and how they were able to save uh, the family farm. And it's based on a true story, although it's a novel, uh, the author pointed out that um, she was not very pleased with all of the, the books for African-American children or children in general, um, and their a portrayal of, of Black people as always being, um, you know, the underdog and having trouble and, and not being successful. She said this book um, that she wrote was a success story showing the Black family in a successful positive light, how they were able to maintain uh, their uh, homeland. And she thought it was a very good title. And it is an award-winning book. It was a uh, Newbery Medal winner in 1977. And Newbery, as many, some of you may know, is one of the awards that are given by um, the American Library Association. It's a division related to youth and young adult literature. Okay, my next slide has to do, and don't ask me why this thing did that. Uh, none of the other slides blended in like that. So that's kind of cute. But um, um, Richard Wright, I'm sure we all are familiar with Richard Wright. He is uh, uh, one of the uh, writers in the African-American canon and his autobiography, Native Son, uh, deals with his tortured uh, years during the Jim Crow South, which he uh, grew up in the Jim Crow South and moved to Chicago where he established his writing career. And another um, mark against him was that he joined the Communist Party and was pro-labor at the time. And his books and all of his other writings were criticized uh, for being anti-American, anti-Semitic uh, uh, and anti-Christian and come under fire most recently for political and religious content. Okay, and then the other favorite, and I was wanting to show that uh, it didn't, uh, the, the band and challenge list included young and uh, young writers as well. And uh, I think we talked, um, um, Shanna mentioned uh, Angie Thomas, 
Uh, she grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, where she witnessed uh, uh, drug dealings and gun crimes, uh, but, but dreamed of becoming a writer. And her first book, uh, The Hate You Give, uh, became an award-winning uh, movie as well as a very popular book. And it was uh, put on the band, challenged and banned list because of its content. And as you can see here, I, I put on the slide, uh, it's most searched for book on Goodreads uh, during its uh, debut year. Uh, and this YA title was challenged and banned at school libraries. Um, and 19, uh, 2017, it came off in 20, uh, 2019, but it's back on the list now, I understand. Um, it says uh, it was pervasively vulgar because of drug use, profanity, and offensive language. But we know this is a reality for our children today. We, they hear it in the home, they hear it on the television, and, and we can't just keep banning these books. We need to use those as teaching moments to teach um, uh, ways to deal with um, uh, conflict and developing um, problem solving skills and you know and just how to be a human and relate and and talk about all these problems instead of having to to use violence and, and bad language and reading is like the a starting point and you have to capture people where they are and if they start with something like this who knows they may go on to read other books but the key thing that we want to do is to protect that uh, freedom to read. Um, so we try to provide materials that will help our, our democracy continue and to help educate the public so that we will have an informed public. That's what we believe as librarians. So uh, Angie Thomas grew up witnessing um, this and so she writes about it in her book. Um, she holds a degree from Bellhaven um, University as well. And her birthday was the 25th. So happy birthday, Angie, <laughs> a few days ago. And this last uh, slide I'm sharing with you is another, it's a blog uh, dealing with uh, current issues um, of uh, banned books and challenged materials within the school system and within uh, the public libraries. Um, so it's as you mentioned, as we mentioned earlier, um, the banned book week starts on the 26th and it runs through October the 2nd. And what we've seen in the, the top 10 most challenged books have been those books dealing with uh, LB, uh, LGTBQ plus uh, representation. And then now we're seeing that returning back to the uh, reflect the banning of the Black ex books about the Black experience in, in the United States. Um, so that's a great website. This article, um, uh, this is a blog, the Mary Sue is marysue.com. And this article was uh, just this past week, I think it was the 21st. Uh, and the last thing down here, it says 60% of the books on the 2020 list were cited for reasons such as anti-police views, citing divisive topics, and being uh, one-sided. I didn't get all of that, but that's basically what it was saying. Um, so uh, in closing, I'd like to say that the campaign um, uh, against uh, books about the Black experience is, is something that's not new. We go back to the 1930s, as you can see from what I presented. Um, Richard Wright was one of several authors who were um, banned and challenged at that time. And we have the Invisible Man uh, with, um, what's, I can't recall his name right now, uh, Ralph, uh, Ralph Ellison, yeah, mm -hmm. Ralph Ellison. So there, there are um, all types of uh, examples over the years. And most recently, I wanna add, uh, close on this, the campaign against the research methodology, critical race theory, I see that as an attempt uh, to ban and limit a, or to censor the Black experience in America, because what we have here is a systematic academic study of uh, the Black experience, and it has been misconstrued somehow in the public 
uh, to the public and to parents and caregivers that they're teaching it on the high school level. Well, not really, not widespread. And I, I think there's a misunderstanding of what critical race theory is. And, and to me, it's a move against uh, us telling our stories and, and the way in which it happened. And last week, I think we had um, Deidre Ford who came to talk about her very personal story. And I'm wondering if, and it's about rape um, and the, her father being um, incarcerated for rape and how she dealt with that as a person. That's a very powerful book. And I'm wondering how that's gonna fare out there, if it's going to show up on some list somewhere, but it's a very good book, a very uh, great uh, uh, book for introducing young adults, college students, uh, to self-examination, to introspection, and how to resolve issues within the family and within the community. Uh, reading uh, is fundamental, I always say, and um, we must continue to protect uh, and celebrate the right to read and to talk about uh, the challenge and ban books over the years is really important because what may be offensive to us may not be offensive to someone. It may cause them to think in a different way and maybe even change their lives. So we don't know what people really need to read. So as librarians, we have a very, very uh, important responsibility and we have to go beyond our own prejudices and to seek out books that are, are for the positive good of, of the community. And I came to Muncie Public Library in 2017 and I've only had two challenges. And those were uh, the first two challenges that we've had in, in I think they said 20, 15, 20 years. And they had to do, one had to do with um, the, uh, a book that was written by someone who did not have the correct credentials. And it had, uh, it was a story of Muhammad, uh, who was the, as you know, the religious leader of Islam. And it was brought to my attention through a letter uh, from a Muslim who saw it in our collection. And this person had even done the research on the, on the writer to show that this person does not have a medical or psychological degree to say all these things about the founder of our religion. And I find that book very offensive in, in the um, collection. And come to find out that the book was recommended by another um, patron. And so we think, well, you know, do we remove this book? So what we did was we gathered together a panel of young librarians and a seasoned folk like me. And I said, you guys figure out what should we, should we keep this uh, title in the collection or, or not? And uh, so I'm not gonna tell you if we did, yeah. We, we ended up uh, letting it stay in the collection, <laughs> but it died a natural death and that it wasn't checked out. Uh, but we looked at the credentials of uh, the author. We look at all of those things to make decisions on the book. And I personally would have pulled it as soon as it was brought out, but the committee and the young librarians who said, well, we'll just let it stay and see what happens. The other incident had to do with a, a comedy DVD, uh, grandpa, you know, grandpa series. And this particular person was a minister, a Christian minister, and he thought that it was just too sexual, too sexual for a grandfather and very violent. And we just needed to pull that right away. And so folks find the grandpa series uh, uh, films pretty, pretty funny. So um, um, I let the, the uh, librarians, again, we called together committee and they decided that, oh, we'll just let it run its course and then we'll, uh, re it'll remove itself based on its circulation record. So we try not to pull things, no matter how um, controversial they seem, um, but uh, we try to, to look at the research on both sides and then make a decision um, by, by committee on those kinds of books. All right, so uh, I just wanna end there. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Then I guess we can go on to the next one. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our 
Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Emily uh, Suzanne Johnson, um, is an assistant professor of history at Ball State University, where she teaches classes on US history. Uh, her research focuses on histories of politics, popular culture, and religion, with a particular focus on gender and sexuality. Her first book, This Is Our Message, Women's Leadership in the New Christian Right, explores the lives and work of famous women who helped to build the modern Christian conservative movement. She is currently working on two new book projects, one about Dolly Parton and another about satanic panics in US history. She is also director of the Muncie LGBTQ plus history project, which is collecting interviews from members of the community in order to preserve this important piece of Muncie's history. Dr. Johnson is a regular contributor to the Washington Post and other outlets. Uh, thank you, Emily, for being with us. Thank you so much, Anthony, and thank you everyone else for your wonderful presentations. Um, I just wanted to mention, um, Akila mentioned Ashley Ford. I have her book here. Um, it's a really great book, and there are a bunch of events happening um, at the at Ball State because she's a writer in residence this year. Um, so I just really briefly wanted to go over some of the history of banned and challenged books over the last 50 50 to 60 years. Um, one of the themes that's come up in everybody else's presentations is this idea that it's often marginalized communities whose books are banned or books about marginalized communities that are banned. Um, and so I wanna focus in particular on the emphasis on banning books around race and anti-racism and books around LGBTQ issues. Um, so after World War II, we see a huge surge in um, people trying to control the curriculum uh, for their, their children. Um, and this comes partly out of the Cold War. It's also, as we've seen, really hard to actually ban a book in America because we have the First Amendment. And so most of these challenges to books are grassroots efforts that come at the local level and are often focused on schools, especially elementary schools, because it's really easy to make the argument that maybe we should protect children. We're not talking about censorship. We're not talking about banning a book, but maybe we should protect these poor little children from these potentially disastrous books, I suppose. Um, so the other thing that's happening right after World War II is a revision of the sex ed curriculum. And so a lot of the initial fights around potentially two sexual books come out of first these efforts to ban sex ed from schools. And then out of that, parents who are involved in those movements start reading different books that might be involved in the sex ed curriculum and get involved in these bigger movements to ban sexually themed books. Um, but since the 1980s, the emphasis around banning sexually explicit books has really been focused on LGBTQ plus sexuality. Um, there was a group in Florida in the late 1970s that tried to ban all books by what they called reputed homosexuals, um, and they included Emily Dickinson, Virginia Woolf, Tennessee Williams, and Walt Whitman. Um, What's interesting to me is that when books featuring heterosexuals are banned for explicit content, it's usually because that content is explicit. There are explicit descriptions of sex scenes. Whereas LGBTQ books have been targeted for being too sexual just for having LGBTQ characters. So one of the oldest or one of the big examples in history is 1989's Heather Has Two Mommies, which is an elementary school level book that introduces the idea of same-sex parents. There's nothing sexually explicit about it. Um, and a more recent example is 2018's Prince and Knight, which is a really sweet story about a prince who goes around the kingdom looking for a princess to marry, and he doesn't fall in love with any of the princesses, but he falls in love with a knight, and they get married, and that's it. And it's pretty much exactly as sexual as a story like Princess and the Pea, um, but because it is two boys in the story, um, it's seen, it, it is, has been um, challenged for being, again, too sexual. 
Um, the other big change or the other big wave of banned and challenged books that we've seen in the 20th and 21st century is this effort to ban books that seem to promote um, more diverse, more multicultural experiences, and especially books by Black authors and other authors of color. Um, one of the most explosive incidents, literally, in American history around this happened in 1975 in Kanawha County, West Virginia, um, where the local school board had approved a new line of books um, for the English, social studies, and other curricula, focusing on multiculturalism. And almost immediately, this was challenged by a local parent named Alice Moore, who got the community involved. There was a huge boycott of the school that involved about 20% of children. But even more shocking than that, um, during the boycott, two schools, th sorry, three schools were bombed. Um, no one was hurt in those bombings. Um, but people were shot at, school buses were shot at, and actually someone was killed over this issue of whether or not we should have books um, about African American history in the schools. Um, so these things became really really violent. And in fact, um, one of the objections about the books was that there was too much violent content in them. So there's this great quote in the newspaper from one of the students who says, like, they're shooting people so that we don't end up reading about violence. Um, so that ended in 1975 when someone was arrested and charged with the bombings and shootings. But it, um, I think, is a really interesting moment in the history of banned and challenged books. And so I'll just end by saying um, that, again, I think the pattern that we see is that it tends to be minoritized or marginalized communities that are targeted by these things. Very, sometimes we see books that are challenged on the basis of having racist language in them, um, but that tends to be a minority of cases. Um, what I find really interesting about these cases as a historian is that it tells us a lot about a community's values, right? So as historians, we're always looking for evidence to see like, oh, what does this community believe in? What does this society believe in? And cases around banned and challenged books are one of those great moments for political historians where people just come out and tell you. They just say like, hey, this is what we value and this is what we're against. And so I think that in itself is really interesting and tells us a lot about American history and politics. Okay, um, thank you. Um, okay, so um, thank you all uh, for uh, presenting. I think we have a, a nice wide variety of uh, people here with their different experiences and, and your different backgrounds and uh, your professional experiences and what you've brought to us and regarding this discussion. So thank you for all of that. Um, there, I know there are a couple people here who are in the chat who are watching. If any of you have questions um, for our panelists or any questions specifically about the things that they have said or anything at all regarding this topic of banned books and censorship, then please type those now. Um, I do know that there may be one or two people in our panel who need to exit because they have to uh, um, attend another thing. And if you need to do so, um, that's that's perfectly all right. Um, thank you for being here with us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and maybe ask a few questions while I keep an eye on the chat. Um, I know some of you actually went through and stated what your favorite band book was. I believe Ralph, said that his favorite band book was a Mark Twain book. I think Akila mentioned Bless Me Ultima was a personal favorite of hers. Um, perhaps maybe would the three of you like to share what is your favorite band book? I think um, our listeners might enjoy hearing that. Emily, what was your favorite band book? Sure, I was just gonna say that I've read Fanny Hill, which was the book that Ben was talking about. It's pretty good. Um, also, knowing that you were gonna ask this, I tried to look up lists of banned books and decide what my favorite was. Pretty much every book I like has ever been, like has been banned at some <laughs> point. So all of them, my answer is all of them. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I remember loving um, Toni Morrison's Saga of Solomon and reading it in multiple, like I read it in high school and then two times in college. And was like, I mean, every single one of her books has been banned in some way. So 
Um, but I also remember reading um, William S. Burroughs' Naked Lunch when I was like really young. And I don't know, it, it was really confusing. I'll just leave it at that. Sure. That is a tough read. <laughs> um, Shanna, what is your favorite band book? Um, I mean, a lot of the books I have read and enjoyed have also ended up on some of these challenge and band lists. I think out of the, the top 10, the one I like the best is the absolutely true Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexie because it's hilarious. And yeah, it has bad language and the, the narrator is a teenage boy and, and he talks about masturbation and things, which is you know some of the reasons it's challenging, but it is really funny, but it's also very serious and moving like the poverty and just the experiences of racism that he went through. It's like, yeah, this is, this is real life. And it's also really funny at the same time. And so you have a lot of ways you can kind of relate to a character that's very different from me. And I enjoy that a great deal. Okay. Uh, personally, um, I think my favorite, I have, I'm probably like a lot of you, a lot of the books that I've read um, have been banned. And, you know, I could, I could, you know, think of George Orwell books and, um, you know, Brave New World and, play, and other books like that. Um, Fahrenheit 451, you know, all these books have been banned and I, they're very popular and I, I do like them all um, and read them several times. Um, um, probably um, something that is surprisingly often banned that I've always just sort of liked, it's a little unusual for me, is the books of Shel Silverstein um, have often been banned and for a variety of weird reasons. And um, uh, I've always just, and I always liked him and I never really understood exactly why I did like him, whatever. And as I got older, I started reading more about him as a person. I had no idea that he was queer. Um, and it just like all the puzzle pieces just sort of came together as an adult for me. Um, something about his um, uh, defiance of authoritiship. And, you know, it's as if, I think in a lot of Shel Silverstein, when you read his poetry, especially the stuff that's written for children, um, there is a sort of an empowering message to children that, you know, you are a good person and I am glad that you are here with us and you have a voice and you need to trust your heart. And that kind of empowering shit to children, I think might be frightening to some people. And I think that's often why he is banned. Um, but I find his wit and his imagery to be uh, fantastically original um, and, and beautiful in a way. Um, another question, I'm still waiting, if any of you people who are in the chat wanna ask a question, or if any of you who are on the panel who have a question for each other, please, please speak up. Um, another quick question though, have any of you ever read a book that offended you personally? Um, what was the book that offended you? Why did it offend you? If you would rather not share, you don't have to, but if you would like to, please do. Um, that might be personal. <laughs> I've been offended by a lot of books, mostly political books on the other side. I mean, you ever read anything Ann Coulter wrote? It's got to offend you. I mean, it just, it has to. Uh, she's just the most egregious example of that. But I can't remember that guy that writes the uh, book that tries to claim that IQ is racially based. That, really exasperated me because it's poor research and of course completely made up that kind of book always offends me but it should you know still should be on the shelf uh, you're talking about the bell curve that's it yeah that, mm -hmm. yeah um i forget the author of that book derek but, something derek um i should know his look it up. because i've met him um <laughs> um who wrote the bell curve? Let me look that up real quick. Charles Murray. Charles Murray? Charles Murray wrote the bell curve. And he kind of, I, I have letters a, from them. I'm thinking of letters from. <laughs> yeah, you. a lot of you know, I probably, I have a fine arts background. Um, the bell curve, Charles Murray. He also wrote um, other books on American culture, um, which I had to read um, in graduate school. Um, he wrote a lot of books regarding art and aesthetic um, criticism regarding music and art and literature. Um, he's written on those topics and he has very conservative opinions about 
music, art, and culture, and what kinds of music, art, and culture we should celebrate and promote and fund within American life. Um, and yeah, it's offensive. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, anybody else have a, a particular title that they personally found offensive? I, I will share um, the Twilight books by Stephanie Meyer, the whole series. I read them all because they were popular amongst teens and I hated them. <laughs> Felt like it was an incredibly abusive, like not good relationship that we're sharing with teens. Like here, look at him and he's going to hang out in her bedroom and watch her sleep without her permission. That's perfectly romantic. Like that, it grossed me out. Obviously, we still have this on the shelf. And if a kid wants it, I hand it to them. But that is one that, you know, if, if I had my say, if I wasn't a librarian and a professional, I would happily just take that right off the shelf and never hand it to anybody. I, I think I've heard other people um, discuss that um, as well. Um, that is something that uh, other people have I've heard that comment from other people regarding those specific books. Um, are any of the rest of you want to share um, something that you've read? I see Ralph is sharing because not everything on the internet is true. I uh, thought every librarian would appreciate that sign. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> it showed yeah. up on my phone yesterday. I don't know why. <laughs> right. Um, would any of the rest of you want to share a title that- Maybe Not true that particularly offended you? I study um, extremist political groups. So I have read a lot of things that have been really offensive. Um, there's a really great one called The Unhappy Gays um, by, oh, by Tim LaHaye. Um, that guy. <laughs> yeah, that he's, guy. he's nice. Um, but I think, there's a real value in reading things that offend us. And I would say that that is kind of the premise of a lot of my research is that it tells us more about the world to read things by people that we disagree with, not necessarily because we're going to come to agree with them, but because we can come to better understand, at least better understand what we are opposing or the people in the world who are opposed to us. Um, I would not support banning any of those books, even though they are really offensive, some of them. Sure. I think the process, personally speaking, I think the process of reading something that's of a viewpoint that does not align with yours, that you do agree with morally, I think it, I find it humbling. And I also at the same time feel like it gives me compassion. It kind of like, gives me a, a, a way to step outside of myself. Instead of being so focused on me, I can see somebody else and see what they're focusing on. And even though I don't agree with that, I feel like it just sort of like gives me some sort of peace that I oddly am able to get, that I, that I don't really quite have that experience elsewhere. Um, that might be a, a little strange, but off of what Emily has talked about, um, do any of you, and this is very complex, do any of you believe, are there, is there ever a situation or is there ever a reason to ban or censor a book from a school or a library that you can think of? No. Okay. I think it opens up the conversation if somebody reads that and they don't agree with it or they have questions like a kid can come and ask their parent ask their adult ask their teacher and it starts that discussion so removing it completely means you don't have the discussion and then they're just free to go off and think whatever they come to think with no input i would rather they have access and to all points of view i think that if you're no oh, sorry I just wanted to to maybe mention um, to comment on that. It's like the book that we had about the Islam. You, it's a teaching moment for you to begin to examine uh, the book. You know, in a way, it, you look at the author. You know, his credentials and uh, compare it with 
what the the recent uh, research is and historic research and if you end up putting it back on the shelf because you want others to go through that same process or to learn to evaluate a book or to figure how that uh, that book uh, what kind of influence that is on you and your thinking in your life so we should never ban a book no because if it's a good book it's going to be read and if it's not, it's going to be pulled from the shelf because no one <laughs> was uh, checked it out. <laughs> That's how we operate in the public library, you know. So. I think that if you want to increase the sales of a book, banning it isn't a bad idea. That's true. Um, <laughs> but I'm always in favor of more information rather than less. I think that often in situations where people want a book to be banned, maybe a better approach would be to put something inside the cover of the book to say, here's what the controversy is, because not everyone necessarily has the critical thinking skills, like they haven't been taught necessarily how to evaluate an author and their background, but you can give that little push when you give the book to a person rather than just withholding the book, which I think always makes people more curious and more excited about reading it, mm -hmm. as with Fanny Hill. I, it's interesting that you say how banning a book can actually make something more more popular and be used as a form of uh, of PR. Um, uh, I remember watching a documentary about um, about sexuality in movies, and they were interviewing Gore Vidal, the American author who also wrote screenplays, and he wrote the screenplay for Suddenly Last Summer uh, with. Um, Gosh, who was in there? Elizabeth Taylor. There's a lot of famous actors who were in there, and uh, he talks about how they they when they released the film, the um, the critics blasted the film suddenly last summer, and they said if you if you like sex and you like cannibalism and you like debauchery and evil, devil worshiping people, then you would just love this film, it's terrible. And he says it was the best thing for the movie because the movie came out and suddenly everybody wanted to see this movie. And the movie was just like a slam hit that summer that it came out and everyone wanted to see um, uh, that movie. And it's a great movie, I love Suddenly Last Summer. It's a Tennessee Williams, yeah. Uh, so, um, okay, are there any uh, final comments? Yes, I was saying goodbye to Ralph. Uh, so bye, Ralph. Uh, okay. I do. I have one last comment. This past week, I got a, an announcement from the Library of America, and it has to do with a new, not really a new, but an uncovered um, title by Richard Wright. And it's called um, The Man Who Lived Underground. And it's a novel about a Black man who was picked up by police after a brutal double murder tortured until he's confessed to a crime that he did not commit. Now, this book was written back uh, in the 1950s, but it's been re-released. And I, I um, wanted to point that out. They're, they're, they're um, producing this special edition of this book, The Man Who Lived Underground, because of the police um, uh, action that's going on now. So we tend to, to uh, to go through all of these these um, these terrible situations with the police. Another thing about Richard Wright, uh, he wrote a poem that influenced uh, a young man who later became a great writer. And we all know to Nancy Coates, um, who wrote uh, Between uh, the World and Me. Well, that title comes from an earlier poem by Richard Wright that was, you know, that was. Uh, uh, censored or, or banned at one time. So because that book was on the shelf at his school or maybe at his home, he was able to, you know, reap benefit of that to, to get a title for his book, if nothing else. <laughs> but I just wanted to point that out. Uh, whereas we may find something offensive, someone else may find it inspiring. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, well, thank you 
uh, mm -hmm. for for all uh, for the people who participated, and thank you for your panelists for for coming and lending your expertise to us this afternoon. Um, this is a wonderful conversation, and I'm so glad that I am employed at a library and I'm a part of a community that is having these types of conversations and how it benefits us all. And again, thank you all. Um, you all have a good afternoon and enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.